This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com, and today the special guest here on the podcast is, he's an artist actually, and we might get into some of his uh, art stuff, and he's also a former WWE writer, the first WWE writer we've ever had on this channel, so possibly the last. Could be the you last. never know. Dave Madigan, how are Dan. you doing today? Dan. Oh, Dan, Dan. Sorry. See, now I already got heat with you. Yeah, no, I, I, you're well prepared for the show. That's good. That's okay. And it's, no, it's actually right in front of me, too, on the screen. Dan <laughs> Madigan. Where did it start? So we, we always hear that uh, a lot of writers don't have any, any wrestling uh, background, but I can tell from the pictures on your social media and stuff, you seem to be a wrestling fan. Was uh, wrestling something you were familiar with before you got into the actual business? Oh, huge. A huge wrestling fan. Um, I, I actually grappled out here in L.A. with Gene LaBelle, and I grappled back in Boston. I wrestled for years in box, so I have an athletic background. But wrestling to me was, when I was a kid, it, it basically was a whole different world. You know, I see these these characters larger than life, and they were um, comic books come to life. And the, when I started to f fell into wrestling, it's the same time I was looking at comic books and looking at um, exploitative movies, grindhouse films, everything sort of came together. So wrestling to me was always on my horizon. I wanted to be a pro wrestler. That was my thing. I wanted to be a professional wrestler. And I was looking at uh, Killer Kowalski had a wrestling school in Malden, Malden, Massachusetts, and I was gearing to go there. And at the same time I was going to be a, a pro wrestler, I decided to be a, a, a painter. So I was a starving painter instead of a starving wrestler. So it was always on my radar. How far did you, did you get in your talks with Killer Kowalski? We've heard from the stories from Triple H in China. He could be very abrupt on the telephone when people would call him. No, I didn't get any traction with Killer. I had a couple of friends of mine that had, were working with him, actually in his school, and I had just at that time fell in love with painting, if you believe it or not. So I put all my energy towards that. That's what I went towards. But wrestling was always in the back, always in the back of my mind. That whole lifestyle, the whole world of um, suspension of disbelief was big Was big in my, my um, I would say, my outlook and storytelling. By the way, Justin B is your cousin. He tells you good luck. Wait, thank you. Oh, yes. Hi, Justin. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you talk about Gene LaBelle. This channel, we also cover combat sports interviews. Um, he's obviously uh, one of Ronda Rousey's trainers. And I had a wrestler on here the other day, Bill Anderson, who Gene actually got into a lot of films. Could you tell us any stories about Gene? I think Gene is probably the nicest guys I've ever met with the caveat. He's the baddest ass, you know, you know, but uh, he, he has a big history of film and television and I'm a big film buff myself. So we would always exchange stories and, and tales and he worked at Elvis Presley. He worked with some big names. I'm a big Elvis fan. So we just talked about movies a lot and the, and the people we knew different stuntmen in common and he's the type of guy that uh, he never really – he never bad mouths people. It's not his thing. You, you know, he's – when you're the baddest guy in the room, you don't have to prove it. But very funny guy, but very personable, a uh, very dangerous guy, very dangerous guy. Now, as far as speaking to that, uh, tough guys in wrestling, Gene LaBelle, I think – he used to be used by uh, Mike LaBelle, the L.A. promoter, to stretch wrestlers that they, they were having problems with. Do you subscribe to the same uh, thoughts of most people in the business that Haku was the toughest ever? Well, if I'd never met Haku personally, but from what I talked to a lot of people, a lot of guys that I talked to and the stories, yeah, he hand, probably hands down probably the toughest guys there. And you, you're talking about a business with a lot of tough guys, a lot of guys from across the territories, across the countries that are really hard guys. And it's a hard profession. But I've heard stories 
told to me, um, Shad Gaspar told me some stories about Haku with different people. And he was a guy you, you didn't want to mess with. He He's the type of guy you want behind you, watching your back and not in front of you, pissed off. Um, this is a hard life. And, you know, some of these guys have to be there in a way to sort of be the um, the speed bump in a way to stop things from going off the rails. As far as uh, you being a wrestling fan growing up, I assume that you may have grown up in the L.A. area as well. Any? Uh, no? No. The funny thing is I'm from Boston. So I grew up when I was coming up, I was in the Northeast. So it was at my time it was the WWWF. It was the Northeast Territory. And this is before the Internet and before really cable TV. So I would watch. Uh, you know Vince's product, the WWF, and and because it was such a territorial um, business at the time, I really didn't know that when I was a kid there was other promotions. I didn't know there was an AWA and NWA. I didn't know there was a different Texas promotions. I didn't know about Gene LaBelle out here in LA. It wasn't until I started reading you know, Wrestling Illustrated, the magazine, and I'm reading. I go, who the hell are these guys? You know, who's Harley Race? Who's Dust, you know, Dusty Rhodes? Who's Ric Flick? And it's hard to imagine now today a wrestling fan saying, well, you didn't know who Dusty Rhodes was or Harley? Well, no, I didn't know because we had no access to that. So I grew up watching, you know, um, Superstar Billy Graham was my guy, uh, Chief J. Strongbow, Don Morocco, uh, Piper Savage. Those were the guys that I grew up with because that's all I had access to. It wasn't until later on when um, TBS opened up and they started showing the shows, and I started reading the magazines. And then I think the first uh, social network were wrestling fans, tape traders. We would trade tapes, you know, VHS tapes. You know, I've got, you know, you got WrestleMania, I got Starcade, we'll trade things. So I think that's that cross pollination of fandom that opened up uh, way before the internet. I'm pretty good friends with Billy Graham, and I've done maybe four or five interviews with him on this channel. So we have a lot of Billy Graham fans. Do you have any? Favorite memory of him you could share with us? Yeah, um, there was a character, um, character, a guy who lived back in Boston. Uh, I don't know if I should mention his name, but he was kind of infam an infamous guy, and Billy knew him. And this guy was um, on the far side of the law, we'll say, and he was a wrestler for a while. And Billy told me some stories when he was with this guy. Billy was always afraid that they wouldn't get arrested. This guy was always doing some type of not just mischief, but felonious type of things. And Billy realized, you know, uh, he's representing the company. He's holding the belt, and he had to stay away from this guy. Even even Billy said that some of these people he hung around with the wrestling business were crazy. But um, I get to talk to him a few times, and I just found him to be a very interesting type of guy. I thought I thought as a kid, this guy was bigger than life. I'd never seen anybody like him. I never talked to anyone like him. I thought uh, that he was going to be the champ forever. And when I was talking to Vince, Vince um, alluded to this. He thinks, I mean. Vince said the biggest mistake he thinks his dad made, and you can, you know, back me up or contradict, was taking the title off Billy when he did. Because Billy had so much heat. Billy was always selling out the guard, and Billy was the guy. And to stop that momentum, um, I thought was a mistake. And I think Vince realized in hindsight that it was a mistake. I don't think we saw Billy's full potential as a champion. Um, but I just, I'd never seen a character as, you know, charismatic like that before and i think that opened the way and you know that opened the doorway to a lot of different people a lot of different wrestlers today old their their um, livelihood to billy well he was also the first one to use the name superstar and as you say that that was definitely one of uh vince senior's mistakes and unfortunately i don't think billy graham ever really got over that mentally because to be like at this peak of popularity and then have it ripped away. And he didn't necessarily handle it the best. He went no. back to digging ditches. Yeah, he did. He went, he went back to, an old, you know, when you're at the top of the world and you're looking down, when you get pulled out like that and you pulled off for no reason, really, if you think about it, in hindsight, it wasn't really a, um, a business sense. It wasn't really a smart sense. And, 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 you know, the business, once you get sort of knocked down or taken down or pulled off, it's hard to get the momentum again. It's hard to get that push again. So you want to keep going. You always want to keep going forward and forward. And it's bad enough with injuries and being hurt and taking time off. And if you're being, if the office is taking you out of that position, it's really hard to get your momentum going again. Now, maybe you can address this. Uh, Matt R says, uh, oh, sorry, it wasn't Matt R. It was Stevie TV 
says your Wikipedia says you're 83 years old. Yes, I look exactly. I look good. You know, there's a <laughs> there's a painting of me getting older and older in the attic. No, I this um, if it's on the internet, it's not always real. So I'm not 83 years old yet. Yeah, yeah like my bones is. feel like it though. My bones feel like the 83 at times. So how did you go from being an artist to, to being a writer? Did you go straight into wrestling writing, or what was your experience? No, my experience was um, I came from Boston out to L.A. because I'm going to get into the business. And so I came out here. I didn't know anybody in L.A. I knew nobody, and I wanted to first get into special effects. I was a big fan of the horror film special effects. I wanted to be another like, Rob Boutin or Stan Winston. And so I figured out how would I get into the film business? And I just took the first job I can get, which is bartending out here. And I started coming up with a game plan and I started writing. And I would think to myself, hey, I want to see a movie that I'd like to see, or I like to direct, or I'd like to write and watch something that I want to see. And it became a long process. And I ended up um, hooking up with an attorney, a big, a big attorney who's now my brother-in-law. And he read my first script and he really liked it. He says, this is pretty good for a first time script. So he sent it out and the different um, agencies read it and ICM picked me up and they, I was the flavor of the month for like five minutes. They sent me out different places and they sent my scripts as writing samples. And at the time they sent it to the WWE films and I, I was in contact with them, a couple of the producers down there and I met with them and they gave me the, uh, you know, we like the way you ride and you're in our wheelhouse, which I don't know what that meant what wheelhouse, I don't know where they're going, but they sort of like my style of writing. And at the meantime, I was taking on different writing jobs. And then I was brought down by, um, one quick story. I was pitching, um, a horror film, a horror franchise. And I came up with a really, really good pitch. I thought was a good pitch. I pitched to this woman who a year earlier was, you know, bringing me, you know, water and coffee. And now I'm pitching movies to her. And I had this really, elaborate, it wasn't an elaborate pitch, but it was a very strong horror story. And at the end she says, I thought the killer was somebody else. I said, well, that's the idea. You're supposed to think until the last scene, the killer is somebody else. It's a misdirect. She goes, oh, I don't know if the you know audience is going to get that. I go, well, if they're not morons, they'll get it. So you know, I walked out of that meeting thinking, here's another job I'm not going to get. And as I walked to my car, my manager at the time calls me and says, hey, the WWE films, they want you to go down and pitch a, an idea for a horror movie. I said, oh, that's great. When do I have a couple of weeks, you know, at least a couple of weeks to come up with an idea, formulate an idea, I can come up with something. And he goes, no, no, they want you to come down tomorrow. T tomorrow? He goes, yeah, yeah, you're good under pressure. You'll come up with something. So I said, all right. So I, and I think any writer in this business always has a horror script in the back of their head or has a zombie script, vampire script, any type of action script. You're always working on something. You have to be. So when I went to the um, studio in Beverly Hills, I met with the producers and I didn't know really when I walked in the room which way I was going to go. I had an idea. They wanted to use Kane. I knew they wanted Kane to be the first uh, icon, horror character. So I started pitching this idea I had. And the producer's sitting there uh, during the whole pitch like, like a statue. I mean, I thought he was dead. I, I, I was to take this guy's temperature. He's not moving. And I'm pitching. I'm trying to get the guy going, excited and stuff. And if I was pitching on Easter Island, I'd have a better response, right? So I'm thinking, here's a job I'm not going to get. And at the end, I go, hit the, the story's over. I go, you know, ta-da. And he slowly blinks and goes, Fitz is going to F and love this story. This is great. He just blew up. And he said, can you send us, you know, give us a treatment or something? And I said, sure. I actually, honest to God, forgot what I was saying. I just, I was making things up in the room. And I came up with a treatment. I sent it to them on a, on a Friday. And then Tuesday, they called up. They said, Vince wants to make the movie. So that was literally how quick that went. That happened like within a couple of days. And the treatment I sent, usually most treatments in this town, you know, five, six, seven pages. That's the most for a treatment. It's, a, it's an overall view of the story. And I said, hell with it. I just put like, a, I did a 54-page treatment. I put everything in it, everything in it. It was like a pulp novel. And if they signed off on it, what I did, I just basically just took that treatment and expanded it to the script. You know, I was taking a gamble and it paid off. So I just fell into it, um, the movie aspect of it, with wrestling as, as an assignment. Now, as I was going down and meeting with the producer pitching this, this movie idea, we talked wrestling. And he said to me, he goes, you know, you know, you know more about wrestling than anyone we know. I said, well, I'm from Boston. I'm from New England. I'm where, where Vince started and I wanted to be a pro wrestler. And he said, have you thought about, you know, writing for the TV show? I said, 
people write that stuff? I, I had no, I was literally didn't know that they had a team of writers and whatnot. I said, no, I hadn't thought about that. And he said, would you like to throw, you know, give your hand, you know, give your hand out? And I so I said, okay. I started. This is when I started watching the show, not as a fan, but you know, really watching with the product. And this is the exact same time they were doing the Katie Vick angle. So you know what happens. Um, and so I, I, watched, I stopped watching by that point, to be honest. I haven't watched lucky. since about 2005. You were so lucky. I started watching the Katie Vick angle, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm, so, I'm actually taking mental notes, okay, what you can and what you cannot do. Sorry, I'm from Canada, too, so I don't even know who Katie Vick is. Oh, Maybe you, you know, just... you're, you're, you're lucky. It was this whole angle where, oh, God, it was this angle where Kane's ex-girlfriend was killed in a car accident, okay? And you could tell that's the border of good taste anyway, right? So at one point, so Kane's girlfriend has died in a car accident. He takes the blame on, and there's a sequence where Triple H uh, comes into a uh, funeral home. You know, it's a parody. He's wearing Kane makeup. He's, you know, the Kane mask and everything. And he literally climbs into a coffin with Katie Vick in there and proceeds to have sex with the corpse. And people say, that I have bad taste. And, and, th and this whole thing gets worse from there, right? So... And I'm looking at what the, the product, I said, geez, with the exception of a child snuff film, you guys will do anything. So I basically look at Katie Vick as the low bar, you know, in wrestling. And uh, some people actually said, I, I, I even wrote that episode. I said, I had nothing to do with it. I publicly thought that was awful. But I took Katie Vick as a starting point, what to build from. And I came up with an angle about mass wrestlers coming in from South America called the Coven. And they're going to take over SmackDown because that's what wrestlers do, I guess. And and the whole idea is this group of mass wrestlers is going to uh, – get the way clear for their leader called the beast and they're all mass wrestlers and the whole idea culminated with stephanie mcmahon tied into the ring tied down to the ropes and her soul's possessed and vince mcmahon is fighting his way through the coven fighting his way through the crowd with holy water going the power of vince compels you the power of vince compels you right from the exorcist and i was gonna have the ring levitate and all this crazy shit and they read that treatment they go this is crazy this is an insane treatment and they hired me that's how it happened. It was. I would happen so quick. I really. It's my head still spinning. How fast it went. So, were you still doing the movie division as well when you were hired to work for the television show? Yeah, when I got hired, um, the funny thing is, uh, Vince hired me to write the movie. It was his. It was his decision that I write their first film, and Stephanie hired me to write for SmackDown, and. I don't think either person told either one I was the same guy. I was the same person. So when I showed up at Stanford, Connecticut, which is the home office, uh, I was the golden boy. Oh, he wrote them first movie. He's on the team. So I was like, I, let's see how long I could parlay this. And that lasted about five minutes, you know. But um, I always tried to keep the movie stuff separate from the writing team. I didn't think it was very healthy to bring the, the – when Vince started talking about the movie in the writing room, I thought that was – it didn't work in my favor. You know, you didn't have many – friends in that room sometimes. So I always try to keep those two things completely separate. The movie was separate, but it's a whole different entity and writing for the team was a different thing altogether. From, from your understanding, I assume it must be profitable, but is the movie division profitable from your understanding? Uh, from, if you look at my royalty checks, not really, but if it is profitable because they're still making films and they're still, they still have their fingers in it. If it wasn't, profitable for Vince, it would have gone by the way of his bodybuilding federation or the football thing or, you know, um, they're still making money. And the thing about films is that when they play around the world, eventually they're going to recap their, their cost, you know, play in America, it'll play, you know, when it, what they were playing in theaters, they play out and they have a big fan base out in, um, the East in China and those areas, they've, you know, they've, they're very popular there. So eventually playing on cable, I mean, I've got royalty checks from like Malaysia for like 87 cents. So the films are always, they'll always find an audience to play, but if it wasn't profitable, they would have stopped a long time ago. So you mentioned that Vince, I guess is fairly hands-on on the movie division. How does he find the time for all of this? I got to be honest. Um, I don't know. I've never seen a guy as focused as Vince is. I mean, there's alpha dogs and he's the alpha of alpha dogs. And you have to admire that um, because I only saw Vince at the capacity as, you know, the, the head of the movie studio. I saw him in that capacity and the head of the wrestling um, job. He was my boss there. But there was many, many hundreds of decisions he made every day as CEO of that company that affected everything. 
the things I didn't know about that if it, his personal stuff, but just the things that affected his, his, his publicly traded company. So the old saying, heavy is the brow that wears the crown. I mean, yeah, Vince, he's up early. It's his mind is always focused on the business. And I could, I could honestly say this, that he loves this business. It's not about the money for Vince, even though he's got a lot of it. It's about the love of the business and for the love of the fans. It's that's what he cares about. He would tell me every day, every Monday, we're on that plane flying out to whatever show we're doing with the luckiest people in the world be working in this business. And so he's, he likes to keep his hands on things. He, I think with the movie business, I, I can honestly say that he he was an outsider in Hollywood, and so he had people working for him that he trusted. I, I think at one point he shouldn't have trusted because I was hearing things back and forth. And, you know, um, you know you're coming to a different world altogether, so you're thinking you're hiring the best people. In hindsight, there are things that happened that shouldn't have happened, but you learn from experience. It's just the way it is. I mean, you can't trust everybody, and not everybody's going to do the best job anyway. It's not your money. So, you know, they're not going to do the best job sometimes. That is 100% uh, true. Now, I guess you worked fairly closely with him then. You mentioned that you would travel to the shows with him. How closely exactly did you work with him? Oh, um, we would travel on um, this plane. I remember the first time we, the writers team, we all went in limo. We were from Stanford, Connecticut, we would drive up to, I think, White Plains, New York with a private airfield and we pulled up and this is big big black plane and this is the wwf and this big lettering white lettering and i i called it the ss purgatory uh and it sort of stuck and michael cole was with me and he laughs he goes you have no idea and so we would always be with vince traveling because the writing team was with him and we always talked about the show it was always about the show uh there was no small talk there was nothing about hey how you doing we sat down the plane takes off. We take off the show. And we work on the show. Now we worked on the show on Sunday. We worked on the show on Saturday. Friday we did meetings. Worked on the show. So the show was constantly being worked on. This is both Raw and SmackDown. So I was with Vince practically, you know, uh, four or five times a week, traveling with them, uh, being in meetings with them. Um, so you, you feel? I thought I get to know the guy feel, fairly well to the extent I could. But I was a fan of wrestling. I was a historian, a film fan. So there's a lot of things me and Vince t talked about that weren't quite wrestling related that he thought I appreciated. So he would give me these little nippets, you know, tidbits of history once in a while, and I found that interesting. You know, he's a very interesting. He is an interesting guy. He's the most driven guy I know. So I have to respect that more than anything. There's been a few people commenting on the alcohol in the background. Are you more creative, like if you have some alcohol in you? No, that I, that's I don't really drink. Uh, the alcohol in the background—that's basically something I I, I found that uh, wooden piece outside my friend's house. I cleaned it up. I got a, a buffer. I cleaned it. Uh, my wife entertains sometimes, so we have that right there. But my thing—I'm a cigar guy. That's my thing. I can go for a long time without a drink as I'm at, but I, I, every time I write, I'll sit down outside, roll a, light a cigar up, and I'm happy. So for those that don't know, including me, other than uh, I guess I have interviewed Vince Russo, but that was a different writer situation. I think yeah. it was only Vince, Rint, Vince Russo and maybe Patterson and a few others. Um, in your time working – uh, for Vince, what's a typical week for you? Do you get a day off, or nope. is it twenty four seven? No. When when Stephanie came out uh, to meet me, she came out um, to L.A. and we met at this hotel, uh, Beverly Hills, and she basically said, uh, "Quote: This is the hardest job in show business. There's no days off, no holidays. You basically seven days a week. You're at Vince's beckoning call. You're gonna work. It's long, long hours." And I said, "I'll do it." I don't know what possessed me to say that. I said, "I'll do it." And I remember my brain saying, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I said, I'll take it. And I said, I wanted to see, you know, you know, every writer wants to see how far they can be pushed. You know, what can they do? Can they work under pressure? And I thought it was an interesting challenge. And my week was Monday, we would um, meet at the office and we would get on the limo. We'd go to the airport and we'd fly out to wherever Raw was playing. If, it, you know, Raw was playing in Texas, we'd fly to Texas. And then if Raw was playing in Canada, we'd go to Canada. And the way it was set up is Raw, if we're doing a show in Houston for Raw, the next show 
will be in Dallas, say, for SmackDown, so we're traveling just not too far, okay? And so I would be with Vince in the plane on Monday. We do a show, live show, uh, in the evening, in the afternoons, the Raw. We'd get, all get together on the plane again, fly out. We'd go to the next city. We would do SmackDown, which was taped, and then we'd fly out again. And we'd go back to Stanford, Connecticut, which was the home office. And Wednesday, which is supposed to be a day off, you're back in the office working. Then Thursday, we had meetings. We'd have a group meeting, all the writers. Then we'd break off. Raw would stay with Vince. SmackDown would go. We'd work usually in a hallway. And then Friday, another big meeting. And it would be SmackDown meeting with Vince. Raw would go off. Then Saturday, we'd have conference calls, which left went on forever and ever. Sunday, sometimes too, there'd be some conference call, something you forgot, and we'd be back working in the office on Sunday. So basically, um, it was all the time. And if Vince, you know, there was one time where we were going to fly into Canada, we were scheduled to leave Sunday morning. And I just got back to my, I was renting a room at my friend's house, and I got back to my room, I just flopped on the bed, and the phone rings and says, we're going to Canada now. I go, uh, what about tomorrow? Well, there's a storm coming tonight. Vince wants to beat the storm. What the, okay, so... Back, pack up the bag, back to the office, flying out because we're, we're going to beat the storm to Canada. So you were basically on Vince's call twenty four seven, and that's what it was like. You're always, you know, you're always around the guy, and you um, you find out what he think, how he thinks, or you think you think how he thinks, and uh, it's always go go go. It's always forward with Vince. Go go go. I understand certain writers are assigned to certain talent sometimes. Uh, I think you were at the higher levels of the writing team, but I know with like the lower level guys, maybe they'll start them with with some of the lower guys and they'll stick with them. Did you have certain talent that you regularly worked for or was it always different? I think because I, because they brought me in with Kane, you know, I, I wrote Kane's character for C No Evil. I started working with Glenn and uh, I sat down, I started talking to him. Finally, he's a very, very sharp guy, very smart. Uh, so we had a lot of things in common. And then I, and Vince told me once, he goes, he says, you think like a heel, which I do. I think because the bad guy always gets his story going. Even when I write a script, the most interesting character is usually the villain, the bad guy, the heel. And so I was working with a lot of the heels. I was working with um, Eddie Guerrero, God rest his soul, Kurt Angle, Undertaker, uh, those are the guys who I always, JBL, who I always found an affinity towards, you know, that negative side, the negative personality, that heel side, the villain. I think they're the ones that get the stories going. So I worked with all those guys and stuff, but I also had a lot of fun working, a lot of fun with the Basham brothers, the FBI, you know, Newton CEO, it was, it used to be a little Guido. I had a lot of fun working with those guys too, because um, sometimes the spotlight wasn't on you as much. You can have a lot of fun. Um, but I, you know, when it comes to the day of the show, you know, when we were, when Raw was being filmed, everyone's on. You know, there's no, at that point, You, if I'm on the SmackDown squad, I'm still working for Raw. I'm writing for Raw. I'm filming for Raw. Same thing. It's all hands on deck. Um, I worked, Eddie Guerrero, I did a lot of stuff with him on the sly. You know, he would call me up and we'd do things. We'd talk a lot. He was one of the nicest guys ever. And I was doing a thing with JBL, which JBL was, um, um, him and Eddie were having a program, and we were down in uh, El Paso. We were in, in, I think, Eddie's hometown, and JBL, we're in the locker room, and JBL's cutting this promo and denigrating the, the Guerrero's history. You know, JBL saying, like, when people came to America in the day, where they, they would come through you know, Ellis Island, they'd see the Statue of Liberty, and they would come to America legally, and, they, and America would embrace them. But not the Guerreros. No, no, no. The Guerreros would sneak in on donkeys late at night, cross the Rio Grande, and he was just denigrating the Guerreros. And standing off to the side is Eddie Guerrero, Chavo Guerrero, and Chavo Jr. Watching this, watching JBL just tear his the family lineage apart. And after it was done, Eddie comes up to me, like almost with tears going, that was great, man. That was fantastic. Hugging me. I want you to write for me. This is great stuff. So he understood what the business was about, you know, and he was just a really great guy. And so I kept in contact with him after I left, after my tenure. Now, I'll, I'll ask some of the fan questions. You have quite a few already. I, I don't know what the extent of you working with Kamale is. I liked him a lot. I've met him a bunch of times. I actually defeated him, for anyone who doesn't know, back when he was still alive. But uh, Donnie wants to know what was Kamala like outside of the ring. Maybe you could tell us what that I, picture's from. I 
we were doing a um, it was a raw. Ali met Kamala that night. He was a it was a guest. It was a guest appearance where one of the divas walks into a room in a back room and Kamala's there and he's banging his belly. And that was the extent, but I had to meet him. I had to, because he was one of the guys growing up with that I, I, I loved. So I wish I, I wish he would stayed more. I wish one to work with him, but it was Kamala was the type of character that I fell in love with. It was Kamala, Abdul the Butcher, King Kong Bundy, the one man gang, George the Animal Steel, uh, Bam Bam Bigelow. And these were the guys that I said to Vince, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, there was more of a physical disparaging between the characters. There were, they weren't all big guys oiled up from Gold's Gym. There were different guys. It, it, there was a, a look. It, there was a different look for every guy, and they stood out. And Kamala, to me, stood out more than anything. So just to see him back there, I go, I got to get a picture of Kamala. This is the guy I got to get a picture with. And I wanted to work more with him. I found him very interesting, very personable, nice guy. Um, unfortunately, at, years afterwards, you know, his, his um, health issues started to get worse and worse. Yeah, unfortunately, it was a, a long uh, end to him and a lot of health issues. Matt R. wants to know if there's any wrestlers that were nice in general, but a headache to write for. I've heard this about a few people. You know, I didn't really, here's the honest truth. I had no problem with people uh, because I think, I don't know it's because maybe I came in as the writer of the movie or I came in a different level. I don't, but I had no problem. Again, like, when I worked with Undertaker, it was Hey, how you doing, Take What's going on? Okay, this is this is this. And guys like Undertaker, you don't have to write a lot of stuff. You don't he doesn't need a lot of dialogue. He's not doing a soliloquy. It's three or four lines. He gets it. Working with Ken, Glenn Kane was fantastic because he 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 got it all. Kurt Angle's another one. Eddie. So um, I think they realized that they're receptive to the fact you're helping them with their career. You're helping them with their character. So I had you know I had fun talking to Jericho. We always had the same love for certain horror movies so we connect on that, on that level as well but as a writer i always said to myself you know there is a well-established wrestler here i'm not going to put words into his mouth that uh, are not true to him i mean he knows better than himself his character what he's going to do i'm not going to tell rick flair what he should say maybe we'll talk discuss maybe this we see the situation going this way but rick flair is going to be rick flair roddy piper is going to be roddy piper if you think as a writer you're going to put words into their mouth that's a mistake. The idea is to let them go. Talk about this scenario. It's like a director talking to an actor. Here's where I, uh, the scene going. I want to improvise the scene. I'm, I brought you on because you've got these talents as an actor. Go with them. And I think the wrestlers at this point, they've established themselves and let them let them do what they do well. Don't try to – I think sometimes you overwrite things. You look at too many – there's too many dot, I's dotted, too many T's crossed. Sometimes, you know, here's what we want to do and go with it. There are things could be overproduced to the point where it has no spontaneity and it, and it dies. So you've got to find that fine line. What where do you start and where do you where do you let them take off? Ha ha Gio wants to know if you got to work or interact with Chris Benoit. Yeah, I did. I did work with Chris Benoit. Um, you know, it's I watched one of his matches once. We, we were cutting some promos together afterwards, and I turned to Paul Heyman. And I said, geez, Paul, you know, he's effing amazing. He's he's an amazing wrestler. And Paul says, don't tell me, tell him. <laughs> so I said to Chris, you know, this is what we're ta working on the promo. I said, not for nothing, Chris, but I got to tell you, watching you work is something else. But you're a phenomenal wrestler. And he looked at me, I swear to God, he looked at me in the eye and he goes, you really think so? And he wasn't being facetious. He didn't, I don't think he knew how good he was. And I was like, take him back. Oh, Chris, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, do I have to explain you the best technical wrestler out there? And um, and we talked. We we were friendly. We were friendly. And I remember when he won the title at WrestleMania, and Eddie was there backstage, and everyone's hugging. And Chris brought his son. I remember in the locker room, he was holding his son. How proud he was! And Daniel was holding his boy and stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, me, this guy really loves his kid. He really loves his family. And then cut to, I think, a couple of years later, I get the phone call. And it's like, if you gave me a list of people, 100 people on the list, that they would do what he did, he was he's not on the list. I wouldn't even think about that. You know, so I worked at Chris Benoit. I think the Chris Benoit I knew was no longer there mentally. I think whatever foundations of reason he had had crumbled a long time ago before he did what he did. So, yeah, it was an awful, awful thing altogether. So I worked with Chris, but the Chris I knew, I don't think it was the Chris towards the end. That uh, the day when 
I guess they did the Monday Night Raw tribute to him. I'm going to assume you were working for the the company then. What was the, what was it like in the writers' room? No, here's the thing. I I was I I kind of just left not too long before that, but I'm watching everything come together. And I was good friends with um, Ed Kosky. Uh, Ed's another writer. Ed, Ed, really good writer, a friend of mine, and he took over head writing positions after I left. And usually I would call Ed and he'd, I'd leave a message. And he would call me like after the show or on the limo ride to the airport. I would, we would fill in. And I found out about um, the Benoit thing. And I said, um, I called Ed to leave a message and he picked up. And he, he never picks up. And he goes, yeah, Dan, it's bad. It's just really bad here. I go, what's going on? He goes, you know, we don't know. At that time, they didn't really know what was going on. Uh, they know that Chris had passed, his family had passed. And so ironically, in a really scary way the week before remember vince mcmahon's limousine blew up and vince was supposedly killed off screen so there are a lot of guys backstage wearing a black armband and there's a coffin there there was a very solemn mood because that was gonna be part of the storyline not knowing that chris benoit over the weekend had murdered his family and himself so there was already a somber tone to that show and now this comes in. So I, I was in contact with uh, Ed. Ed goes, this is really bad. And then during the show, Michael Cole and I, we just texted during the show. And Cole had said, um, he goes, it's getting worse. They're finding out bits of information. It was getting worse and worse. And it was just a really, because we've never, ever canceled a show. And no, no show had ever been canceled. Even when Owen Hart passed away, the show went on. People have had heart attacks and died. And so for Vince to cancel a show, the magnitude of the situation was unparalleled. And then the next day to find out what happened, you pull all that stuff back, you go, okay, we got to now do damage control. It's just, there is no page in the playbook to deal with that. And you, you know, you don't see that scenario happen often. So when it happens, you just make the best of it when you can and you just go forward. Now, someone wants to know if there was any ideas pitched to you in wrestling that were really horrible besides Triple H's necrophilia. Uh, I think that's, I, you know, and I didn't, I wasn't even there for that. I showed up afterwards. I thought that, listen, a good necrophilia story works. If it works, it works, right? You need the right premise. Read Edgar Allan Poe. His stuff is all filled with this dark type of um, uh, depraved writing. But it's done in such a way that it's acceptable or it's hidden, the subtextual things. Uh, there was a few things pitched to me that I was... You know, I just sort of, well, at one point, who am I? I mean, I'm the last person to say something's a bad idea. Let me hear it. Let, let's hear it. Maybe there's something in there that works. Um, and a good idea is a good idea. I used to get really good ideas from Jimmy Coderis, the referee. We would talk for the show. He'd say, hey, I'd pitch idea. That's a good idea. And then, ironically, I would bring up Jimmy's idea into the writing room, you know, with the other writers from the shows. And they'd hear the idea, and they're sort of interested. i go, that was, you know, Jimmy Coderis' idea. And all of a sudden, it wasn't good anymore. And I said, listen, he's the ref. He's in the ring every night. He sees the crowd every night. He knows what the crowd's feeling. I would take his ideas over anyone else's. Um, but if an idea comes from a writer or an outside person, if the longest the idea works, if there's a kernel of something that can go, listen to it. Let's hear it. That's how Paul Heyman looked to me. I would have these crazy ideas, and Paul would hear them out, hear them out, and, he, and he'd wait till I finish. He goes, okay, that's crazy. Here's what works. He doesn't. His, this doesn't work. So it's a learning experience. I mean, I pitched ideas that, you know, as you know, became quite infamous. I'm trying to get away from. But this is pro wrestling. If we can't push the envelope, why are you in the business? You know, wrestling is just an extension of you know, reality. And we are the ultimate storytelling element. You've got the ultimate good guy. You've got the ultimate bad guy. So the idea is to push things to the extreme. If you go too far, then you pull back. So... I never heard any stories that were worse than a necrophilia act. So everything to, from that, like everything's uh, A plus compared to that. Now I noticed this too: the Texas Chainsaw Massacre poster in the background. Flamethrower also says he loves it, and he's wearing a Leatherface suit right now. Okay, uh, <laughs> could you tell us a little bit about? Uh, which Texas Chainsaw Massacre you like the best? The first one is definitely mine, the original. Well, first of all, back here, I have this up. Uh, in the back, we had a big tree, big shade tree, um, this window. And we said to the you know, gardener, just take a little off. You know, take a couple branches off. He decapitated the thing. I can see a solar flare in the sun now. So I put this here so I'm not backlit. But um, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is 
one of my favorite films, the director, Toby Hooper, I became very close with Toby. I became, uh, towards the end of his life, his caretaker. He used to introduce me as his son, you know? So I became very close to Toby. And when I was putting together my dream list for Cena Weevil, I was talking to Toby all the time about it. And he, he read the original script, the script that they went on, not the script they filmed. He wanted to direct it. He loved it. The character I created at the time, the Jacob Goodnight, who was called Lester Goodnight, he says, you know, Toby was from Texas. He goes, Dan, God damn it, Dan, you you created the leather face of your generation. Because he was nothing like what the final product was. So Toby was all excited. I would I would talk to him a lot about it. And we were trying to do something together. But his first film, this first Texas Chainsaw, is horrifying. It, it's unrelenting. It doesn't stop. It's also a, there's a sense of black humor. If you watch the film, there's a real black humor underneath it, and the film is unrelenting. It's it's the real it's the real uh, essence of dread. And what Toby does in this film is he implies things. You think you're seeing something. You think you're watching something. It's not. He implies things through sound, through edits. Everyone says, yeah, he he Leatherface picks up the girl. He throws her on the spike, you know, the hook, and then you see the blood come. The, there's no blood. It was never filmed. Everything's bits and pieces. Everything's implied. He uses, he lets you use your imagination. It was Toby called the MMPA. He said, how would I film a young girl being put on a spike or a hook? And they said, you can't. They hung up on him. So he did everything around it. Um, so this film is, is legendary. This film is great. Um, the second film Texas Chainsaw 2 that Toby directed is great also, but it's done more as a humorous film uh, going forward. Toby knew he couldn't repeat the success or the momentum or the intensity of this film. So the second film is more, it's more laid back, more tongue in cheek. And you know, it's, the ride's going to be just as intense, but not as horrific. I was supposed to pitch uh, the remake of this. That's how I met Toby. I was um, hired basically to re remake Texas Chainsaw. And things fell out the last minute, but they loved my pitch, and Toby heard about it. So I became friends with Toby, and that's how that relationship grew. So I got to the horror world as a fan, end up becoming very close to the guy that made my favorite film. Someone wants to know, were you around for the Sean O'Hare Devil's Advocate character? Yeah, I was there when Sean got – I was there when Sean got – cut so i don't know the exact same time but the thing about that was we were in detroit and we were in a writer's room a writer's meeting and there was um there was an agent's meeting excuse me agent's meeting and all the wrestlers the agents were there and the writing team was sitting in the back and sean i think was hanging around roddy piper or something and someone put a bug in vince's ear i guess sean o'hare was late with something and someone made another comment on sean and the person next to me said said watch this he'll be fired and everyone started chiming in about Sean O'Hare, Sean O'Hare. The next thing you know, 30 seconds later, Vince goes, give him his 90 days. And they the guy called. He says, yeah, they got to get rid of him. Um, I thought he was a real talent. Oh, there was real potentiality there. And like most guys, when you get to that level, they, they see something in you, a sense of potentiality that you can go farther. But sometimes when you get to that point, you flounder. And a lot of guys, there's sometimes there's not enough storylines to go around or people aren't paying attention to them because they're focusing too much on certain people. And I think that a lot of people get lost. They're, they're right at the, that higher echelon and they sort of fall to the wayside and no fault of their own sometimes. There's just sometimes there's not that much attention put onto the right people at the right time, if, if that makes sense. I thought he was an interesting guy. I thought you could have really done things with him. It's the same that he, another guy that passed away very young. Matt wants to know, were you around when Freddie Prince Jr. was working for WWE? No, Freddie came right after me. I think Freddie took my job <laughs> to some extent. You know, I think he came right after I did. Uh, that was in the mid-2000s, I guess. Um, it was interesting that the guy of that level, you know, who, who is a film, a noted film actor, would um, take a gig like that. He must have been a real fan. But, you know, after a while, we sometimes you do cross paths with people sometimes backstage, other events and stuff. But I would never met him out in the wrestling world. Now, speaking of that, where you say you're surprised a, a noted film actor like that did it. Um, I wonder if the what the pay is like for writers. Is it uh, is it lower for WWE writers than it would be for like a movie writer or well, that's everything's different. It depends on when. They paid me just enough, the WWE, to put up with the aggravation. 
You know what I mean? They give you just enough. Okay, this is all this is the, it's aggravation, it's bullshit. But when you look at that paycheck, okay, it's worth it at that point. In Hollywood, it's a whole different ball game. Um, there are writers who toil for years and years who don't make a dime, uh, who don't make it. Uh, other guys will come in, make one or two scripts, and get hit hit big time. So it always fluctuates, and you're only as good as your last story. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. It's you're only as good as your last hit. Um, and out here too, you really don't have any allies in this business. You've got collaborators and accomplices, but you know, there's really no advocate. You've got to be your own advocate out here. So, you know, you can have a you can have a lawyer, you can have an attorney, you can have a manager, you can have an agent. The best thing to have is an attorney, because I had an, at one point I had an agent, a manager, and I was paying them, and I was getting all the work myself. Every script I've written, every movie I've worked on, I've got myself. So you've got to really push it out here be, to be your own advocate and stuff. So um, there are writers I know they're always getting big, you know, six-figure deals and guys who are just barely paying their rent over the years. With, um, and most guys, if you make any money, you sort of fall to the latter part of that. You know, you're always hoping for that one big gig that's going to put you over the hump. But it doesn't – by the way, I have a lot of friends that have gone over that hump and that money stopped coming. So you got to be wise with – when you get it, you got to be wise with it. Gary says your book, Mondo Lucha Go Go, is one of the best Lucha Libre books out there. You're a great writer. Could you tell us about this book? Yeah. When I was um, working for Vince, I had a friend of mine who was a, a, a book agent, and he calls me up. He was working for um, HarperCollins, an imprint in HarperCollins. And the people there, they wanted to do a Lucha Libre book. And no one really knew what Lucha Libre was. I mean, they had an idea. It was Mex Mexican wrestling. And they said, would you like to write this book on Lucha Libre? And I said, would you like to pay me? I mean, sure, I'll, I'll write a menu. You pay me, I'll write a menu. I'm a mercenary. And so I was working with uh, the Guerreros. And they, at the time I was working there, Vince thought there'd be a conflict of interest if I worked on the book. So I said, okay, you know, I'm not going to piss him off, right? It was more Stephanie thought there'd be a conflict of interest. So I would talk to Eddie and Chavo on my own and collect and get these ideas. And then when I left the company, I started formulating the book. And I would talk to Chavo for hours about Lucha Libre because Chavo's father, Gory Guerrero, is one of the most famous luchadors in the world. And his partner was uh, El Santo, the atomic pair. So you have these two famous wrestlers. And Eddie would tell me that El Santo was like his uncle. He'd live at the house. He knew him his entire life. And even living in Eddie's house, living with Eddie, very few times El Santo took his mask off. You know, so that's how much they live this world. So when I started doing the book in general, when I when I left WWE and I had the Guerrero's blessings, so people in Mexico started opening up to me. They, you know, if I was just the outsider, um, it's a very cloistered world. People would shut off to me. But once I said, "Hey, Eddie Guerrero, or Chavo Guerrero, or people that they knew," everyone opened up to me. So I was down in Mexico and um, watching the matches, Tijuana, talking to people, just gathering a lot, a lot of information. Um, I think I had 5,000 images. My my pal, Ed McGinty, who's a film director, Ed was taking the photographs. Ed was going down there, taking photographs, shooting the matches for me. Um, and then I had all the writing done. I got, I got all the much. I had to cut out. I cut out 40,000 words. The editors called me to go, this is the most information, any subject we've ever had. We have to cut out like 40,000 words. That's another book. So I cut out. I had to cut out all this massive chunks of the book and make sure that everything still flowed together. And then when I sent everything to Harper Collins, they said, this is great. And we were full of, it was full of photographs and posters and stuff. And they said, all we need is release forms from the people that own the artwork. I said, release forms. They go, yeah, any, any image needs a release form. All the photographs, I'm saying to myself, these photos were taken 70 years ago in Mexico. No one knows who the hell took them, let alone who owns them. So I said to Harper Collins, I said, yeah, send me a copy of the release form, you know, what it looks like. So they faxed it over. I looked at the, you know, you've got to find out who owned, who took the image and whatnot. I said to my brother, okay, make 100 copies. We sat in this office. We forged every name. We just made it. We got the phone book, and we made up every Mexican name we could. I write with my left hand. I pretend I had a palsy. We just started writing names. We sent them to Harper Collins, and that was it. You know, that was my due diligence on that aspect of it. But I did do a lot of research, and I called one guy in Mexico. His name was, his last name was Agua Sanchez. His dad 
was a famous producer. His dad produced many of the Santo films, the Blue Demon films, the Mil Mascaris, all the Lucha films his dad produced. And since his dad made these movies, people have been using his posters, ripping them off, taking all his, using the posters for different things. So I, I found his address and I said, listen, I, if, if possible, may I have permission to use your posters and your dad's posters in this book? And he said, you're the first person ever to ask my permission ever to call me, the first person. You have my blessing, good luck. And I said, oh, I appreciate that. And then I said, listen, you know, your dad produced all these great Santo films, these Lucha Libre movies. You know, where are they? And I'm hoping, he says, oh, they're right down here. Come on down here. You know, I'll make a deal with you, whatever. And that's my mindset. And he says, son, this is Mexico. No one knows where they are. So all these movies that were made, no one knows who has the rights to them, where they are and stuff. So the book, the, the Lucha Libre book, Mondo Lucha Gogo, was a really fun book to put together. And uh, I was working with Eddie back and forth, corresponding when he passed away. So I dedicated the book to him. Um, but it was it really opened a lot of doors to me. To In fact, my business partner now, um, my company, Lucha Taku, that all come, it came about because he saw the book on the front page of the LA Times. So, you know, you never know what you're going to do and what's going to happen and how it's going to lead someplace else. But the book led to a couple of documentaries I wrote, led to other writing gigs. So it was a nice, it was a nice accomplishment because I had the Guerrero's blessing when going forward with it. Now, I have heard of Lucha Otaku, but could you elaborate on what it is for the fans that may not have heard of it? Okay, Lucha Otaku is the company that I and my partners created. It means fight geek. You know, um, it's everything that, I liked as a kid growing up. It's my remember that there was a show at, uh, out in the United States called Night Flight. It was on Friday nights, Saturday nights. It was a it was a combination of bizarre videos and artwork and strange movies. So Lucha Taku sort of represents everything that influenced us. It's we're more or less a production company. We were look, working with wrestlers. Now my partner's a film director. He's an editor. I'm a writer. I produce. So we basically Lucha Taku is it's an it's an umbrella company for production for entertainment. Two years ago, 2019, we put together a, um, a tryout. We were working with Sonny Ono and Cass Hayashi. They were with Russell One at the time. And we had these tryouts throughout America. There was six dojos, uh, one in Los Angeles, the Inoki Dojo, a couple in Texas, New York. And we had over hundreds of wrestlers come together to try out because we were going to take 10 to 12 wrestlers to work in Japan. They were going to... They're going to train for two weeks with Cass Hayashi. They're going to try to get a match at the Corken Hall. And so the response that we got was phenomenal. We had the best turnout ever. We had many people from all different people flying in from uh, Vegas, people driving for hours. So we had a great response in LA alone. So every dojo throughout the country had a major response. And through all these dojos, we picked the 12 people, our first inaugural class. We took them to Japan. And they loved it. It was the time of their life. Some of these people, the first wrestling match was in Cork and Hall. And so the, it became so popular that a lot of the guys now working in Japan, they became guys have gone over and they're working with the Japanese promotion. So my company, Lucha Otaku, um, we're a promotion that, you know, we're a, we cross pollinate American wrestling with Japanese wrestling. And we sort of, with that bridge that goes back and forth. And Sonny Owen was part of that. And it went so well that last year we were gearing up for a, a, a bigger event, but COVID hit. So that put the kibosh on everything. So that was the big monkey wrench that sort of stopped the momentum. But now we're back up again. We're, we're running again. We have more trouts coming in the future. We're dealing now with not just one wrestling promotion in Japan, but several. Sonny's our liaison. Kas Hayashi's back on board. My partners are together. So the response we've been getting from people from gyms and dojos, not just in America, but in Canada and some in Europe and England, it's been overwhelming. So we're going to have another tryout. And people will come and we'll try out and we'll take, once again, the top 10 to 12 and the, with the most potential, we'll take them to Japan. And we'll start, we start this uh, relationship with Japanese companies bringing wrestlers to Japan to train, learn that style, and they come back to America to work. So that's what one of the things Lucha Taku is doing besides some other projects, film projects we're doing as well. Renee D wants to know who is the most difficult wrestler to work with? For an analyst. Um, hold on, no, that's not a trick question. I really, I really didn't have a problem with the wrestlers. Uh, I think the fact that they respected me, I respected them. Um, I never a problem. Like I, did, I never really worked with Triple H. He was always off on his own, and Shawn Michaels. Those are the two guys. Never, I never really had contact with storyline wise. But everyone else was. I mean, Taker knew exactly what to do. Um, 
Kane, Kurt, I would give Kurt Angle three, four pages of dialogue. He'd just get it, boop, boop, done, Eddie. So every JBL, same way, he would just, he, he'd get it. And think about it. I'm giving them dialogue they're just getting that they're going to have to probably say within an hour. They've got to learn the dialogue. They have to know the matches, know the angles. They're, everything's coming at these guys the night of the show all at once. One big ball of confusion. And they keep it all in the head, which is great. So I don't think I had a problem with any wrestler one-on-one, -on -one, you know, um, um, personality wise i think you know we're all there to do the job you know get the show going get you ready for the show so um there were times i had problems with wrestlers characters like where, where do you see a character going like you know after a certain situation where's this guy gonna go that was problematic sometimes but not the person themselves but what you do with the character sometimes became an issue john stewart wants to know if there's any storylines you came up with that you thought were great ideas but for whatever reason they didn't use them um well every writer is going to say every storyline is a great idea so that's right after everyone's going to talk about i i you know i've learned you know, i had some storylines that worked that didn't work and so i was i think the the thing i was proudest with i was work i was part of working with um the crit angle eddie guerrero uh, storyline where they had the, their big match that that was a lot of fun working with that uh, working with Eddie and JBL when we did the match in LA there was like a slaughterhouse the blood was everywhere that was another fine storyline to work with I I gotta be honest I had a lot of fun working with Eugene um, and I'll tell you why when when Nick Densmore sent those tapes up he was at OVW he sent these tapes up of his character of Eugene and he was more like a Rain Man character. He wasn't. Like, he was more on the farther end of the spectrum, if I could say that. And I'm watching with Vince and some of the team. I go, you know, there's something here, but I think we need to make him more accessible to the people. More not likable, but more accessible to the people. I said, make him more so he's more on the different end of the spectrum. He's more upbeat and like this. And we need someone to go with him. We need someone. This this character has to have someone complete opposite to work with him. That's the that's how contrast works. And I had just met. William Regal, like a week earlier, he just coming back off an injury. I said, "How about putting him with William Regal?" And Vince goes, "That's a great idea." He goes, "You call Regal, tell him to be on TV tomorrow." So when we sort of put Eugene with Regal, that was a lot of fun because Regal's a brilliant actor. I mean, he can he looks like one of the Cray brothers. He's a great actor. He's got these he's great at, um, voices in the back room, and he has a lot of experience. So seeing this unkept kind of wacky guy Eugene with the very prim and proper Regal I thought was a good combination and like most stories they started hitting they weren't hitting it off together very well there was conflict but slowly the kid Eugene got under U Regal skin and, and Regal started to like him and there was a bond there and even though it's wrestling you know you're telling a story it was kind of interesting how they were getting together this relationship and then Regal pulled me aside once and we were talking and he says you know Dan um, I'm a heel and I'm going to by nature have to turn on him and I go, yeah, you know, you're right. And he was, and I knew that. And it was a moment that me and Regal were both kind of sad, like, you know, geez, that's kind of sad what's going to happen. But he turned on him in a situation he didn't want to do it. And I remember when we filmed it, the day we filmed that scene, it was kind of very touching. I thought it was very, even though it was wrestling, it was a very touching scene. And I thought that um, that was a fun thing to work with. One thing I'll tell you, I really thought that summed up what wrestling really is, at least to me, we were filming in Boston, which is nice. I was in my home city. And we would, it was me and the film crew, with Undertaker and Paul Bear. And we were filming a scene with Paul, uh, Undertaker's walking out of the darkness towards us. So we, we needed uh, a long area. It wasn't really a hallway. Nothing was really lit to be that dark. So we went down to the loading docks and there was these long semi-trailers, long trailers. And so we set up so Taker would be in the trailer, the end of the trailer, and he's walking towards us, you know, and you see him emerging from the shadows and Paul Barris could be to the side. So we're setting up the camera down there. And at the end of this long hallway, there's a door where people came in that have, you know, special needs people, people with a wheelchair, people that are triple walkie would come in through this way. And a, a dad's bringing in his son. His son, I think, had uh, palsy or something awful and that the kid could see undertaker and the kid was just sh shaking he was excited and i went to take i said take you know um you got a fan down there and the taker never breaks character doesn't never breaks character he's stone face he walks all the way down the hallway this looming big guy with this this the hat down to here this cape and it's like it's like the grim reaper coming out of the shadows and he looks down at the kid he puts his hand on this kid's shoulder he goes how you doing buddy and the kids started to cry. The dad started to cry. The crew started to cry. It was just an amazing moment. And then take a walk back. And um, I said, geez, take, that was something else. And he said, 
if that's the least we can do. And that's true. You know, if what we do brings some joy to someone like that, then it's kind of worth it. I mean, that's why we do it in the first place. That's why they do it in the first place. That's why we create stories to detain people from cave paintings to computer screens. We create stories to detain. That's why we do it. Rec 46 wants to know if you have any JBL bullying stories. You know, I like John a lot, and I can see what John's position as being a um, – We'll say an enforcer back there, but I'll tell one thing, and um, and John will back me up because I don't like John tonight. We was I was working with um, me and John, and God, Todd. No, it was who's the um, the young kid from Tefan? What was he? The announcer? Oh, my mind just went blank. What's his name? Oh, Justin Roberts. No, not Justin. I know. No, it was before. It was um, he was the young. God, I'm going. I can't believe I'm going blank. Um, was his name Matt? Was his um, anyways? A young announcer. It'll, it'll Does pop he work up. for Impact now? He used to work for Impact. Yeah, um, Josh Matthews. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank. I can't. I, I'm sorry. He's a nice. I can't believe I blank with Josh. So it's Josh Matthews, and we're fi we're, we're just going through everything. We're just going to go through, run through what we're going to film, and in the promo, in the B-roll, we're going to film. JBL is going to, you know. S slap Josh Matthews. And I'm thinking, okay, we're going through this. Okay, let's, which we're setting up lighting. Bubba's got the camera. And Chris is lighting. So we're just getting, you know, the look of it, how it's going to be. We're running through it. Practice. JPL comes up and he slapped Josh. It was like a Tex Avery cartoon. The poor kid's face just elongated, and you could hear this slap. Like holy shit! And, and the poor kid's had this big red mark on his face, like this. And so now we got to wait 10 minutes to the Marcos down. There's no way he can film it now because it looks like he's got some put red paint on his face. And Josh took it like a chant, man. He took it standing. And I said to John, I go, when we film, let's just you know, don't kill him. All right. Just, you know. So we waited and John whacked him again right across the face, you know. Um, that was the closest I'd say to bullying, but that's, you know, it's a hard business. I wouldn't have done that, but I'm not JBL. But I've had a lot of fun with John. I think John's a very smart guy. I think John loves the business. And I think um, there's, a, you know, as everyone knows watching, there's a hierarchy in the business. And you've got to sort of respect the boundaries to what who was there before you and how you proceed going forward. So I think John was there to make sure that those uh, lines were not crossed. Um, did he have glee in doing it? He probably did. I don't know. But, I mean, I give all credit to Josh Matthews for taking that shot. Donnie wants to know who was your favorite wrestler to work with and write for. You know, um, unofficially, I, it was Eddie. See, officially, I was told not to write for Eddie Guerrero. I was told by certain people, uh, he's off limits. You know, uh, I'll write for him. And Eddie would call me and say, Dan, they don't know. Can you? So I, I would always talk to every, any. Time Eddie called me, we would talk, and I we talked about different things, and he was just like the nicest person in the world. So, unofficially working with Eddie was great, but I think working with Kane was a lot of fun because you know I had get to know Glenn, I get to know this character, this, this bigger than life character, this monster. Then I get to work with Gene Snitsky, and Snitsky was just another big large life character, this real um, monster heel. So I'm still friends with uh, Snitsky, and um. You know these large life villainous characters worked well for me. I worked well. I worked. I worked well with Kurt Angle too. I think. I, I think. I said. I'm, I'm a heel. I think. I, that villain mentality to me gets the story going. And these the guys. If you look at every good story, it's the villain that gets things going. Your hero is just the guy who's reactionary. He's going to wait till the bad guy does something. But the bad guy, and every every good bad guy, if you think about it, in his mind, he's not the bad guy. He in his mind, he's the hero of his own story. He wants something. He's the doer. So working with these guys, these these wrestlers that were out there just wanting something, I, I really found a kinship to that. You know, So I think working with Eddie was great. Working with Kurt was great. Undertaker was great because you didn't have to write a lot of stuff. I mean, three or four lines. It was perfect. He knew his stuff. Uh, Kane was always a lot of fun doing it. I had a lot of fun with um, Nunzio, Little Guido, the FBI. They were fun to work with. There was a lot of fun with those guys. The Bashments were fun, you know, and they were very appreciative too. You know, you throw a guy a couple of lines here and there, like, hi, hey, man, thanks a lot for thinking about me and stuff. Thanks for putting me on the show. I saw wrestling as a variety show. 
you know, you've got all these high intense matches, then you've got matches that are as intense. You've got maybe a humorous section because if you keep having a show with all these high intense matches, you're going to burn off the audience. You're going to burn off the wrestlers. So I always saw the show as being um, to be up and down, humorous, fun matches, matches that are serious, real serious matches, sort of give a, uh, an amalgamation of different things to people. Um, so I always had fun with everyone. Everyone I worked with, I tried to have the most fun out of it because it's a new experience to me. And it's a new way of writing. Every character is different. If you're writing a screenplay, every character has to have a different voice to them. If you're working on a wrestling show, every wrestler can't sound the same. Every promo can't be the same. You've got to vary it up and stuff. I mean, if you close your eyes and every wrestler sounds the same, there's something wrong. Someone wants to know what your favorite wrestling era was. And I think he means any Boston stories because he's saying any Chicago stories. Oh. He's actually from Boston, everybody. Yeah, no, Dan, Dan from Boston. Well, I would go to the Boston Garden, which is no longer there. Uh, but I would go to the Garden as a kid. And just to see, I remember, I remember distinctly, I was in the Lowell Auditorium. And this is where I'd see like different fights. I saw like you know all the Golden Gloves matches there, different wrestling matches. But I was in the, in the Lowell Auditorium, and Andre the Giant walked by me. I was at an end seat. I tried to get the end seat as always, which you could stand on the, on the seat. And I remember looking up to him. It was like looking at like Jack and the Beanstalk. I was like, "What the hell?" And he walked by me. I, like his shadow felt heavy, walking by me. And those moments stayed in my head, seeing him and Ch Chief J Strongbow. And the first time you see them live. It's the first time you see you see guys on TV all the time, but you see them live and you hear the show, you smell this taste, everything about it becomes it's like a real carnival coming to life. Those impressions stayed with me. And when Andre stepped into the ring, he just he towered over every he towered over big men. So that was when the first thing that stayed in my head, well, this is a larger than life carnival coming to life and stuff. And then when you see Billy Graham live, you see Don Morocco, when I saw Piper walk in the Boston Garden, the crowd went absolutely crazy. He was a natural heat seeker. And you see, how does someone, how does the character get to this point? How do you create a persona where everyone hates your guts? And if everyone hates your guts, you're doing something right. That's the best thing in the world. I, I thought, and I look back now, I realize, so I used to watch TBS Wrestling. God, I hated Jim Cornette. I, I hate Jim Cornette. He, I hate Jim Cornette. Jim Cornette's a genius. He's doing his job. He played his part to the point where I hated Jim Cornette. I realize now that Cornette was a, was a genius behind it. I, I think he – I listen to him a lot. I think he's fascinating. Um, but those were the characters that – the guys that you hate that I fell in love with. I thought, to me, the great of all of wrestling, of all the time and era, to me, the one person that exemplifies what wrestling is to me is Bobby Heenan. Bobby Heenan, to me, if you said, what is wrestling, I, I put to Bobby Heenan. This is the guy. He he knows wrestling, but he's larger than life. He's not just a color man. He's not just a worker. He is what wrestling is. It's spontaneity. It's fun. It's different. It's dangerous. And I look to people like Bobby. When I saw Bobby in the 70s and 80s up to the 90s, that was my favorite era. Anything with to do with that era. But now with YouTube, I go down that rabbit hole like anyone else. I'm looking at stuff from the 50s. I'm looking at stuff in England. I'm looking at stuff in Japan and Mexico. So you find different flavors you like. But to me, it was the 70s and 80s because that was the most – That's the that set an imprint on me. And anything with Bobby and Gorilla Monsoon, that was the combination that made wrestling uh, special to me. Your cousin here says uh, good stuff. You used to take him to shows in the 80s when he was a little guy and he misses you. Yeah, I miss you. Oh, they're all back in Boston. My cousins, Justin and David. Ironically, they're monsters now. They're all bodybuilders. They're, they're huge. You know, my cousin, John, they're all sort of like just sprouted up and grew and stuff. But we used to go. I remember taking my cousins to see the first WrestleMania. Oh, that was something else. You know, you had to get your tickets and stuff. And then, I, you know, for the subsequent, you know, fourth. Ironically, the first three or four WrestleManias I take my cousins to, I, I end up working WrestleMania 20. I'm backstage working it. So it's funny how things work because I grew up watching Vince McMahon. I would see Vince McMahon on TV Saturday mornings at noon. It was wrestling. And then from 12 to 1, this wrestling. From 1 to 4, it was horror movies, Creature Double Feature. So my entire childhood, I've, I've never really grown up. I still work in wrestling. I still work in horror movies. So I'm just in an elongated state of arrested development. Uh, but the first time I saw Vince outside, I was going to see a Clash concert. 
And at the Cape Cod Coliseum, I'm waiting in line, and the limousine pulls up, and Vince McMahon walks out, and he, he goes to the box office to get the receipts and tickets, and I go, that's Vince McMahon. And people go, who's that? Go, that's the guy in wrestling. That's, I didn't know he was the owner, by the way. I, you know, At that time, there was the kayfabe. You didn't know what Vince was the owner of the company. You just thought him as the announcer. And I, I remember seeing Vince at the box office going, wow, I mean, wonder what it is to work with this guy. Years later, uh, you find out firsthand. For that WrestleMania, I've never actually met anyone that's been to the first WrestleMania. What was that experience like? Uh, I I went to a I was at a closed circuit. I bought tickets at closed circuit. Um, you know, I didn't go. I wish I was at the first WrestleMania. So I I mean, I was at the. Um, we would buy closer. It's like all the big fights before this pay per view. You buy the tickets for the fights, and when I saw Hagler Hearns, we went to the Lowell Auditorium. Same thing, WrestleMania. You go to the Lowell Auditorium, and uh, but you could still see there was something about WrestleMania. Uh, even it's a, it's a closed uh, venue. There was a buzz. People, everyone's sort of united. Everyone's sort of like, yeah, WrestleMania. And everyone's now you share the same common language. There's a commonality with people and stuff. And you realize, wait a second, this is a business. This is a sport that unites people. Because you can go to most people certain age, you know, 30s, or 40s, or 50s, 60s, and you could ask them about one or two wrestling stories. Most guys will have a wrestling story. Most guys will say, I remember this guy, I remember that guy. And it was a pivotal part of growing up for some people, wrestling. I, I got into wrestling when I got into punk music, when I got into comic books, painting. It was part of who I was, that whole persona. So everything sort of came together. So even when I got away from wrestling, it still pulls you back in and stuff. I mean, I, I try to go, get away from wrestling now, and I'm, and I'm working with Japanese wrestlers. I was working with Mexican wrestlers, you know? It's like the mob. You never get out of it. You try to get out, but somehow you pulled back in. Peter wants to know, is, as we wind this down here, what wrestler had the best in-ring talent but had not the greatest mic skill, and what did you do to handle that? I, I think... Um, I don't want to talk out of school. I also don't want to get beat up. But I think that's why this manages. I remember when I first saw um, Bobby Lashley. I was like, we went down to OVW. I was like, oh, my God. This guy's this guy's a monster. This guy's a, a tremendous. You know, what can, what he doesn't have skill-wise, you can always hide. You give him a manager. Or you give him a partner who could pick up the slack. You know, there's always ways to, ways to hide things. Um, I remember I remember there was we had Viscera and Mark Henry. And I wanted to put those two together. I, I said, there's, there's a killer, unbeatable team. I was going to call them the Black Alps. This is the, you know, these guys are unbeatable. Um, I said, I want, you can just have these guys with a manager and they're unbeatable. Um, and once again, if there's a problem with the mic skills, you just sort of like you, you small promos, have someone else cut them for them, give them a partner, give them, always hide the weaknesses. Another thing I learned from Paul Heyman, you know, you bring out their strengths, you hide the weaknesses. I mean, People say Roddy Piper wasn't the best guy in the ring. He was a great performer in the ring, but you gave him the mic, forget it. Piper was the greatest guy, mic guy there was. So you find out what you're good at and you accentuate it, and then you give someone else, you give Piper Bob Orton to work with, or someone else, or, or Paul Orndorff. Um, this is a business of like, um, it's like a magician. You hide things, you bring things out. I think Chris Benoit, I had, I had trouble with Chris Benoit with promos. Um, he was so full of energy. I don't think he knew what to focus the promo sometimes. And I say, Chris, with you, less is better. You're the, you know, you're the Wolverine, the aggression. Just less is better. And we would do a lot of cuts. And I would go again. I go, just, just, you know, do it quickly, like your matches, technical quickly. You don't need to say a lot. You're very, boom. Here it is, succinct. Brevity, brevity. That's what get things across. So I think the hardest time I had with someone was Benoit, and it's only because his mind was always racing and racing. I said, Chris, you don't need a lot. Just You just came off a big match. You're going to do something in the match spectacular. Just give the crowd just a little taste of it and go on. So I think that, I think that answers the question. I think it was probably Benoit. Now, for fans that want to follow you or look up your Lucha Otaku um, projects, where can they do that? I would just look up uh, Lucha Otaku, you know, Lucha, L-U-C-H-A, Otaku, which is, means means fight geek. So look up Lucha Otaku, luchaotaku.com. Um, also look up Grand Japan. Um, Grand Japan is the promotion I created with my partners, the Sonny Ono. 
that's where we're putting together uh, Japanese, pure Japanese wrestling matches throughout America. So Lucha Taku, Grand Japan. There's something else we're working on yet, but we haven't quite signed the contracts yet, so I can't really, I'm not liberty to say, but we're doing something in the virtual world as well. Um, and that's coming up soon. And for anyone that hasn't seen my interview with Sonny Uno, it's on here. It's like two and a half hours, very detailed. I'm still friends with him. I'll put up, for some reason, the motion graphic won't load, but this is a sample of your art, which you have posted on your uh, your Facebook, at Dan Madigan, if people want to look it up. Damn but do you want to tell us anything about your art before we well, close off here? Yeah, no, it's funny. My artwork, I mean... um. Ever since I was a kid, I was getting censored. I, I got censored as in, in fifth grade. The, the nuns brought a psychiatrist in to throw me out of school. They thought I was crazy. They found some drawings I did. That, you know, at the time, they would have put me on ADD and written and thrown me out. But they were, you know, kids' drawings. And they were very, we'll say, antisocial. And so I was always getting into trouble with censorship. I got in trouble in college with censorship. When I worked in movies, I got in trouble with censorship. Um, Wrestling, I got in trouble with the Japanese royal family. The Church of England came after me. You know, you don't realize sometimes your work can offend people. And I've always thought that uh, my artwork is not much of an artistic expression. It's a social commentary. So I worked for Disney Animation for a while, and they asked my department to do an art show. They, they asked every department to do an art show. And I submitted some of my collage work, some of my artwork and stuff. and um, there was like a hundred people that loved it. People loved the work and one person complained. And so the president of the company pulled me aside, Peter Schneider. And he says, listen, I love your work. I think it's great. I can't have it on the wall. And he, so he said, your work makes people think. So I took all the artwork off the wall and I had my car in the parking lot. I put all my artwork around the car and I had my own, um, everyone from the gathering, you know, the art show came outside with their white wine. They walked around my car and they saw my, my show outside in the parking lot. You know, you're supposed to create, whether it's wrestling or writing or art, you need to push these envelopes. You make the people have to not feel safe. You got to push them. So my artwork, uh, if, I'm not, if I'm not painting, I'm doing collage work. It's always been on that realm of um, uh, religious themes because that was the first thing I saw as a kid when I was learning to paint. I didn't go to museums or galleries. I would see paintings in the church. I would see crucifixions and saints being martyred and stuff. So the first time that I had access to art, it was very brutal. And so that's going to stay within you sometimes. So my art always has a thematic theme of redemption, salvation, uh, religious connotations. And it's got me in trouble at times. But still, you know, if you can't, if you can't push yourself, then why are you even there? If you're not offending someone, if you don't offend someone, you're not doing something right. Yeah, I kind of subscribe to that too. Well, it's been a it's been a pleasure talking to you. I know we went over time here, but I was kind of bombarded with fan questions, and I only asked a small percentage. So maybe we can have you back sometime. And if I'd love to, I'd love to come back anytime. If you need something from me, let me know. And maybe in a couple of weeks, couple of months, you want to get together and do it again. And who knows? I'll get in more trouble by then. Who knows? But I had a great time, and I really, uh, really appreciate you uh, reaching out to me. I really thought I want to thank um, Maurice Shorthall from Cheap Heat, uh, the podcast. He hooked us up and stuff, so I was really righteous of him to do that. So thanks a lot, buddy. Yeah, I uh, he's from Ireland, and yeah. you guys can check him out. Cheap Heat, search it up on YouTube. There's an interview with you on there. I'll let you close it off however you want. I just want to say that whatever endeavor you do artistically, like, like I just mentioned, whether it's wrestling or storytelling, writing, you've got to start not worrying about what people think about you because they don't think bad stuff about you either way. It's going to be about the work. And I can honestly say that I can walk out of a room, I can have 100 people hate my guts, but you know what? You've got to respect the work, whether it's artwork, writing, book, novel. You've got to put it into the work. And that's the card you leave behind. So – whether it says be true to yourself, be true to the work. If you can't push yourself to the point of break, then don't be there. Then, you know, that's that's my last thing. I get fired from different jobs because I pushed it, but at least I know where to go now. Thank you for watching the Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please